Good morning and welcome to Daybreak Asia. I'm Sherry Young. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. The markets are set to give their verdict on the DPP's victory in Taiwan's presidential vote, with analysts saying it removes key uncertainties. The election of the U.S.-friendly Lai Qingda being seen as a setback for Xi Jinping's strategy despite the tightest result in decades. Plus, money managers going long on higher prices for Brent crude as Houthi rebels report new U.S.-led strikes in Yemen. Yeah, well, Sherry, geopolitics, that's one of the key focus points for investors as we kick off yet another trading week here in Asia. But uh, adding to that as well, there's a couple of different factors we're going to be eyeing quite closely. There's expectations for the Fed, uh, where the money markets have got it right in swaps markets, and t telling us that we're going to see around 170 basis points of cuts ahead. Uh, maybe that's a little bit too aggressive by, by some estimates. Earnings as well, that season kicking into gear. We had the bank earnings coming out. We've had airlines. We've We've had luxury as well, and a little bit more downbeat news seeming to come out from a lot of company CEOs. Plus, you had China's economic health into the mix, and we had loan data at the end of close of markets on Friday telling us consumers, corporates, households, they're really still not looking for cash. Uh, these are all sort of some of the factors we're going to be watching quite closely, how that plays out over the trading dynamic in this week ahead. But so far in the session, you can see here the ASX 200 holding fairly steady. It still is the holiday season or holiday period in Aussie markets, so liquidity has been pretty thin. But you can see here, fairly range bound. Let's uh, switch on. Take a look at what else is happening so far in the session today. Again, it's a little bit mixed, a little bit to the downside, perhaps to a degree. You've got Kiwi stocks likewise trading, and then you've also got the Japanese yen continuing to hold close to that 145 mark, Sherry. And, Bell, of course, we are in a long weekend here in the U.S. It's a holiday on Monday with the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. But we are seeing U.S. futures to the downside of about a tenth of 1%. This after a slight gain on the S&P 500 last week. Of course, we had Microsoft overtaking Apple to become the world's most valuable company. And we had the U.S. earnings season being kicked off by banks with some results missing estimates. Their outlook for net interest income not great given, of course, uh, what is projected to be the Fed rate trajectory. The Treasury rally uh, took another big uh, leg up with the two-year yields dropping for a sixth consecutive session to the lowest level since May. We had surprisingly weak PPI numbers, uh, the declining producer prices reinforcing those bets on Fed rate cuts, and this coming after a higher-than-expected CPI reading, so we know that the path for the Fed might be a bumpy one. The dollar also fell, reversing that weekly gain that so given that yields were under pressure, we're seeing the dollar index at that 102 level. We're following uh, prices for oil very closely as WTI is under a little bit of pressure early in the Asian session after we saw uh, prices gaining ground with the U.S. and allies launching airstrikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. But of course, investors in Asia will be very much watching the Taiwanese market and they're set to give the verdict on the election of Lai ching da as Taiwan's president when the Asian market it's open in the coming hours. Uh, the DPP's victory is also being seen as a blow to Chinese President Xi Jinping's strategy for the island. We are telling the international community that between democracy and authoritarianism, we will stand on the side of democracy. Now from Taipei is Bloomberg Markets co-anchor Yvonne Mann. Yvonne, so what is the message that Taiwan's ruling party is trying to send to the international community? Yeah, good morning, Sherry. I think for one thing is that democracy won this weekend here in Taiwan. And in some ways that, you know, despite China's threats that this saying that this election was a matter of peace and war, Taiwanese voters defied those concerns and elected the DPP for a third straight term here, which we've never seen before in the history of Taiwan. Uh, you mentioned about, you know, the what we're seeing here in terms of the results. So, yes, it was a historic win. Yes, it was by a wider 
uh, that expected margin. But then again, only receiving 40 percent of the votes uh, for Lai Ching-te, uh, which goes to show that, you know, had we had seen this coalition party between the KMT and TPP, we would be talking about a much different result here right now. And the DPP lost its majority in the legislature. So no clear mandate here. I think that certainly is not lost when it comes to the DPP on how they're going to move forward and all this, because uh, with a divided government now, he's going to have to negotiate with other parties on budgets, on legislation to get anything from his agenda through here right now. So that certainly is uh, a, a DPP that is emerging out of this election a little bit on the weaker side. But then again, uh, this is also a sign that, you know, a bit of soul searching for the KMT and Beijing as well. You talk about how this is a bit missed opportunity for Beijing. This is a Taiwan, as we see, that is becoming more Taiwanese. In fact, people self-identify themselves as that more so than China. Yeah, so what's been the response from Beijing so far? I would say pretty low key, uh, right? Because, you know, we've already seen before leading up to this election that Lai Jingte was labeled an instigator of war, a separatist by Beijing. We're not quite hearing that sort of language here in the statement that we got from the Taiwan Affairs Office uh, yesterday. Uh, Lai's name was not mentioned. Uh, of course, they reiterated, you know, China's stance on they still want reunification with Taiwan. And they said that that 40 percent mandate received by Lai, quote, could not represent represent the mainstream public opinion of the island. Uh, so it is softer language compared to what we saw four years ago. Keep in mind, when you remember when President Tsai Ing-wen won that second term by a landslide, China state media was labeling her as selfish, greedy, evil. On the military side, it's been quite muted response as well. The defense ministry here said that they've seen four Chinese naval vessels and one weather balloon around Taiwan yesterday. No PLL planes have been seen uh, in the air defense zone here in Taiwan. So uh, we're not seeing those uh, scores of jets or that military force being displayed here. Uh, you know, nothing like what we saw when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan last year. So you are seeing at least some compromise right now from, from all three sides, even the U.S., right? So we heard from Lai uh, during his victory speech still reiterating that the Taiwan is going to still seek cooperation with the U.S. I don't, I don't think we can go as far as saying that they were, they're going to have dialogue because the sticking point is still that 1992 consensus, uh, which says that Taiwan is part of China. The DPP still rejects that, and that is a red line for Beijing. But we also heard from President Biden as well shortly after to this election results saying the U.S. does not support Taiwan independence. So there's still some olive branches, as you can call it, uh, being seen here right now. Some reassuring words after this election, Sherry. And Yvonne, when it comes to the Taiwanese economy, its chips industry is so important. Our very own Stephen Engel asked about the security of the industry to Lai ching -da during his first post-election press conference. Take a listen first. How do you help mitigate the risk that increasing tension with China essentially could weaken that strategic advantage, that strategic importance that the chip industry provides to Taiwan. As long as there's equality and compatibility between the two sides of the straits, Taiwan is willing to engage with China for exchanges and cooperation. We will vigorously assist the semiconductor industry in material and equipment R&D, IC design to manufacturing, packaging to testing, to form a more complete industrial chain. Analysts have talked about how the election outcome doesn't necessarily change the global trend of de-risking and that we are going to see more movement away from China, yeah. away from Taipei as well. Uh, how has Taiwan's industry been doing, given that, of course, we have talked about the ongoing slump in the semiconductor industry as well? 
Right. And, and, you know, you take a look at those U.S. export controls on China as well. I mean, that has no doubt impacted Taiwanese chip makers and the, the tech supply chains here uh, in the island. And so you got to wonder if a DPP win, does that mean uh, that we'll see more scrutiny from, from U.S. companies on, on, you know, chip makers like TSMC here and how they're procuring their chips and where? Uh, is it from China? Um, I, I think that what the analysts are telling us is that, you know, maybe there is status quo is status quo, right? That it's not going to be some big change in terms of sentiment here. But, you know, how these, these Taiwanese companies navigate these two superpowers, the U.S. and China, is going to be quite key here. Um, you know, some are saying, you know, the fact that it's a DPP win does in some way secure Taiwan's position as a, an independent location to fabricate chips for AI servers and the like. Uh, and maybe that means, you know, with the DPP having a better relationship with the U.S., that they will have better access to chip making equipment uh, with the West as well. So that could be a, something that could be beneficial. Uh, but as you say, right, this whole global trend of de-risking is not going to change with this election result. You, you are seeing itself with the likes of TSMC. They're expanding in Japan. They're expanding and, and building capacity in Arizona and the U.S. as well. So uh, I think that just decoupling is something that's still something that might stay. I think the pace of which that happens might slow down, right, if it is a DPP win. Who's to say, though, right now, Sherry? But certainly, at least for now, markets-wise, as you say, I think people are taking it in stride. Yeah, we'll be waiting for the market opens in Taiwan. Bloomberg Markets co-anchor Yvonne Mann, they're joining us live from Taipei. And other geopolitical headlines that we're tracking. Houthi rebels in Yemen say U.S. and U.K. fighter jets have hit targets in the Red Sea province of Hodeira in fresh strikes on Sunday evening. Al-Masira TV, which is operated by the Iran-backed military group, reported the attacks. The U.S. and its allies have been bracing for a response after dozens of airstrikes on Houthi targets in Yemen since Friday. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is said to be planning to meet with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Zelensky is seeking to replenish the country's coffers for its fight against Russia, with calls for help now being eclipsed by the Israel-Hamas conflict. J.P. Morgan has been advising Zelensky on attracting private capital for reconstruction projects. Zelensky is also set to make a public address at Davos. Coming up, our exclusive interview with Panasonic Energy's Chief Technology Officer Shoichiro Watanabe. We'll discuss their plan to EV battery upgrades later this hour. But first, a deep dive into China's economy with Oxford Economics. Hear why they think upcoming data could show stimulus-driven growth continuing to pick up. This is Bloomberg. We've got cost push pressures coming in. I suspect we will see inflation at the CPI level get stuck at 3%. And then the Fed is going to have to make a difficult decision, either tolerate it for longer or try to reduce it to 2% too quickly and risk um, the real economy. Bloomberg Opinion columnist and University of Cambridge Queen's College President Mohamed El Arian there. Let's take a look at the week ahead. In a couple of hours, the PBOC will announce its decision on the medium-term lending facility rate. The central bank has signaled it may deploy monetary policy and liquidity tools to boost economic growth. Later this week, we'll also be getting a snapshot of China's economic performance in 2023 with fourth quarter GDP data due as well as other key indicators for December. On Wednesday, Bank Indonesia will unveil their latest rate decision. Bloomberg Economics expects the bank to stand pat as its hikes this cycle have been aimed at rupiah stability instead of cooling price pressures. On Friday, Japan inflation data might show consumer price gains slowing. We'll also watch for CPI prints from the Eurozone and the UK. Other data to note are GDP figures from Germany, PPI numbers from Japan, Australian jobs data, and TSMC earnings. Bloomberg will also be on the ground in Davos for this year's annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Top world and business leaders, as well as central bank heads, will gather at the Swiss Mountain Resort, uh, Resort to discuss the overarching theme of rebuilding trust. This, of course, amid a backdrop of geopolitical tensions. And that's your week ahead. 
Our next guest says the incoming Chinese data will likely show stimulus-driven growth continuing to pick up, but less so for consumers. Louis Liu is a lead economist at Oxford Economics and joins us now. Louis, great to have you with us. So let's talk a little bit first about what sort of data we're expecting out of China, because, of course, we get the complete 2023 picture as well. Are we going to get that about 5% growth? Yes. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Um, absolutely. So I think this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, the, the big question is really, has all that stimulus announcements that we've heard at the end of last year, has that really translated and filtered through to the economy? And I think this week, the data will show, um, as you said, we, we do have the complete set of data, not just the GDP data, but we also have data, uh, some of the more high frequency data, like retail sales, fixed assets, investments, industrial production. We also have some data on how household spending and expenditure uh, and, and um, consumption um, data as well. So all that data will probably show that some of that stimulus has worked, um, but perhaps not as effectively as authorities wanted. Um, I do think that that 5% growth target last year is going to be well within range. Um, in fact, we think that they would exceed that by a little bit um, and coming in at 5.2%. Despite the rebound that we're seeing in the Chinese economy, when it comes to today's MLF, the medium-term lending facility, the consensus is that we might see the PBOC mm. cutting again. Why do that on the monetary side of things when we have seen mm. that perhaps it's not as effective as a fiscal push? I think it's more signal, right? Um, the it, you're right. Um, it's not going to be that much more effective, especially if expectations is you know a, a further ten bit um, decrease. Um, I do think that the start at the start of the year, um, the the kind of host of data that we saw, especially the PMI data and the CPI data that we saw last week, it does suggest that the economy did start the year on on pretty weak um, footing, and I think they will be quite sensitive to that. Um, and if they had decided to hold the policy again um, today, I think that will probably send a signal that that might not be very confidence boosting. So so I do think that um, that 10 bit cut today it would, would come and it would probably serve to kind of reinforce the, the policy easing bias that the government has. But I think in general, um, the, the heavy lifting of stimulus will probably fall on the fiscal side rather than the monetary side. So tell us a little bit more about the Chinese consumer because the rebound has not mm. been so for the Chinese public, right? We saw how the economy is still in its longest deflationary track since in 14 years or so. When can mm. we expect that demand to rebound? I think I think I think the authorities would like to think that you know if you support the supply side of the economy, if you support production, then eventually the demand would come. That obviously is not how um, the rest of the of the other major economies operate, um, and and for that reason, I think authorities have been quite um, quite reluctant on some of the more obvious demand side stimulus. You know, for instance, cash handouts or maybe more broad consumption support, and that's really the reason why you know even though we've seen some. Um, spikes, some temporary spikes in consumer spending in, in last year, um, that hasn't really persisted. Um, and I think that the, the reason behind that is, is really the fact that confidence is so low, right? I mean, it's not really an ability to spend. Households in China do have around 3.6 trillion renminbi in excess savings. So they do have the money to spend, um, but it's just that confidence is so low um, just because what's happening on the property side, what's happening on all these negative headlines that's coming out on a, on a you know, almost weekly basis on the economic front. Um, so the question here is, how do we raise confidence? Um, and I think you know, if 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 we are not willing to extend direct consumption support to to um, to consumers, then it does seem that it's going to be quite a tall order this year to to achieve meaningful consumer spending growth. Louis, it's a little bit of a quiet week, at least here in the U.S. We're on a holiday. What will you mm -hmm. be watching when it comes to the Asian eco docket? Because we also have some trade figures, I believe, a rate decision mm -hmm. from Bank Indonesia mm -hmm. as well. What will be important to you? Um, I think that the trade data across, you know, Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia, that will probably show, um, a, a kind of give a glimpse the fact that, you know, the, the external demand outlook continues to be on a very slow recovery trend. So that will be somewhat encouraging, um, at least for, for some of the more export-oriented economies in Asia. Um, Bank Indonesia will be one to watch. Of course, they meet every month. Um, so so the, the policy um, guidance there is quite well signaled. We think that the fo focus on rupiah stability, the fact that the 
the rupee has been quite stable as well over the last month would suggest um, that they will pause. Um, um, I think that the Jap- the Japanese CPI data that would be something we would watch as well towards the end of the end of the week um, that should suggest that inflation a uh, disinflation trend should start to slowly come into the, the picture this year. Louis, good to have you with us with that preview of EcoData coming out of Asia, lead economist at Oxford Economics. And of course, we'll bring you the latest when it comes to China's MLF uh, later today as well. You can get a roundup of the stories that you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers go to DayBeGo, also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize your settings so you only get the news on the industries and the assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Asia. Economic, financial and business leaders are gathering in Switzerland for this week's World Economic Forum. The theme this time is rebuilding trust. Here's a look at the main issues set to dominate discussions. White Alpine Mountains, billionaires and the global elite. It can only be Davos, the tiny ski resort in Switzerland, home to the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Here are three key topics high on the agenda. Number one, a dovish pivot. Despite all the talk of higher for longer, sticky inflation and robust labor markets, investors are now pricing in aggressive rate cuts by key central banks this year. Following the cost of living crisis and the unprecedented cycle of global monetary tightening, reduced borrowing costs cannot come soon enough for debt-strapped companies and governments. And the next crucial question is whether policymakers can make the pivot to avoid a hard economic landing. Two, rising geopolitical pressure. World leaders were already grappling with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, launched by Putin's forces nearly two years ago. The much-anticipated counteroffensive by Kyiv hasn't quite gone to plan, and foreign support and military aid is not flowing as freely. There's now also a second conflict on the global stage between Israel and Hamas. The humanitarian cost has been immense, and the war has the potential to spark wider tensions across the Middle East with ramifications for global trade. And three, just two letters, AI. Investors are obsessed with its potential to disrupt chunks of the economy, and it drove some of the biggest stock market gains last year. Pressure is now mounting on tech companies to deliver on some of the earnings hope. And in the hallways of power, security and ethical concerns remain. The EU struck a landmark agreement to regulate artificial intelligence, and it could set the tone for similar rules by governments across the globe. Of course, Davos draws a lot of criticism as being exclusive and out of touch with reality. But key politicians and industry titans continue to go in droves. And as long as they do, the buzz will remain along with the potential for meaningful change. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix there. Take a look now on how equity markets, or I mean currency markets, are trading at the moment. Take a look at how the Bloomberg Dollar Index is doing. Not much after falling in the last session, of course, pressured by those Treasury yields. The Japanese yen also uh, seeing a little bit of weakness against the U.S. dollar. 145 is your level after two weeks of losses already. We had heard from sources that the Bank of Japan officials are likely to discuss cutting their forecasts for inflation and economic growth last week and take a look at the Aussie which is uh, rather steady after two sessions of losses we'll be watching Aussie jobs this week and we're seeing the Chinese Yuan holding a touch below 720. We'll be talking oil next. This is Bloomberg. at how U.S. futures are trading today. We're seeing a little bit of downside pressure. Of course, it's a long weekend with markets closed on Monday for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. But we had seen uh, those gains when it came to the S&P 500 on a weekly basis, although the S&P 500 was pressured on Friday. We have seen, those, of course, those big tech moves with Microsoft overtaking Apple to become the world's most valuable company. But also the U.S. earnings season kicking off. We had some bank results as well, a few uh, misses. 
pieces here and there. And what we're really following closely was the Treasury space because the two-year yield dropped to the lowest level since May. It was really on um, that broad expectation that the Fed will need to cut rates sooner rather than later. And this, of course, coming as we got uh, that eco data, the surprise decline in U.S. producer prices reinforcing bets on Fed rate cuts, despite the fact that we got a hotter than estimated CPI reading. Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Elarian expecting U.S. inflation to stick at 3% due to fresh cost push pressures. He also told us why he sees growth risks ahead for the U.S. and other major economies. My major concern is that if you look at the three systemically important regions in the world, um, economically, the Eurozone, the U.S. and China, all three are having issues growing in a robust manner. The U.S. is the exception there, but even the U.S. now is facing lower household savings, higher debt. China needs to fundamentally change its economic models. And we know that without a healthy Germany, Europe is going to struggle. So if you actually look at who is the locomotive of growth, it's very hard to point to one locomotive. Um, it's hard to believe that the U.S. will be able to maintain what was very impressive growth rates. Now, put on top of that the geopolitical concerns, and that's why this recency bias, where people simply extrapolate what was a surprisingly good year from last year, is something that we have to guard against. So you're questioning the resilient growth story. Are you also questioning the disinflationary trends, Mohammed, that have started to develop over the last 12 months? Yeah, I smiled when I heard the conversation before I came on that, you know, it's disinflation ahead. It's not. We're going to see, and we already are seeing, cost push pressures in the pipeline. There's two in particular. What's happened to nav navigation in the Red Sea is directly and indirectly increasing inflationary pressures, directly by hiking input prices, indirectly by causing shortages that then influence other prices. And then we have the labor market issue. We have higher labor costs coming through the pipeline. So you've got cost push pressures coming in. <coughs> I suspect we will see inflation at the CPI level get stuck at 3%. And then the Fed is going to have to make a difficult decision, either tolerate it for longer. And I was encouraged by John Williams' use of the word, a longer term inflation target is 2% or try to reduce it to 2% too quickly and risk um, the real economy. But this notion that immaculate disinflation is going to continue is something that I find very hard to reconcile with actual data. Let's finish on Fed policy. Expectations, they go in March. What's your gauge of what the threshold is to begin to reduce interest rates and how close do you think we are to it? There's no reason they should go in March. Um, I think the market is over-optimistic, both in terms of timing and in terms of the amount of cuts we're going to get. I think the market should listen to the Fed when it says signals around three 25 basis point cuts and starting later than March. I think it'll be the summer when they start. Bloomberg Opinion columnist and University of Cambridge Queen's College President Mohamed Alarian speaking to Bloomberg's Jonathan Theron. Annabelle, of course, another central bank that we're watching today, the Bank of uh, the People's Bank of China. We are expecting that one-year MLF to be cut. Uh, what are we seeing? Yeah, that's right. OK, maybe the Fed isn't likely to, to, to reduce in March. We were just hearing that there from Mohamed el Arian, But still, the PBOC could actually be uh, first up here. So we've got the decision that's due on one-year policy loans. Uh, that's the line here in white. And you can see it's at 2.5% right now. It's been that way since August of last year. But we could see a 10 basis point reduction. That's what a lot of economists are guiding for, to 2.4%. Uh, there is a lot of pressure, of course, and we can get to the economic weakness in China in a moment. But there's also just the seasonality factor or perhaps the timing that plays into it as well because uh, many people that were spoken to are saying that the PBOC is likely to front load any sort of reductions here given we're approaching that Nationals People, Co People's Congress, the annual legislat legislature meeting in March and that's when the growth targets are announced as well. So that's uh, why we're seeing the, the PBOC guiding its interest rates lower. 
But also, let's get to the economic reason for this to happen, because one of the latest things, if you change on now, that's played into this is the credit data. Uh, so we saw new yuan loans aggregate financing. This came out on Friday following the market close. Both of those missing estimates here. But new loans at issuance, that's the weakest that we've seen on record, that, that increase there, and also missing on the aggregate level. Uh, we're in double-digit gains versus what we used to previously see, which was... Uh, rather single digit now versus double digit previously. Uh, let's change on. Something else we're watching within that credit data is just what's coming through from corporate and household lending. You can see here a household in yellow, corporates in pink, a huge drop off as well. So it just tells us, Sherry, uh, consumers, they're wary perhaps about the property sector. They're not wanting to get loans. Corporates as well concerned around the health of the property market, that drop off in demand. It's all playing into that dynamic, which tells us that we weakness in China's economy to persist. And of course, as well, that really plays into the demand dynamics for oil uh, that we're continuing to track. Yeah, it's really interesting what we're seeing in the markets because despite the fact that we saw those attacks by the U.S. and the U.K. and the Houthi rebels in Yemen, we are seeing oil right now losing ground and not sustaining those gains that we saw last week. Traders are still keeping a close eye on whether Iran will be drawn into the conflict, but perhaps, as Bell mentioned, it's a demand picture that's not looking great as well either, right? Let's bring in our next guest who says the oil supply demand outlook remains bearish. With us now is Vandana Har founder of energy market intelligence provider Vanda Insights. Vandana, always great to have you with us. So uh, what are your expectations for oil prices this year, given that any rally that we're seeing in oil prices uh, are, don't seem to be sustained at this point? Uh, good morning, Sherry. So, um, indeed, the picture that is emerging, uh, looking out into 2024, uh, is one of uh, overwhelming uh, downward pressure from um, an, a view of uh, plenty of supply and sluggish demand growth. You've been talking about the U.S., China, and the general economic outlook earlier uh, in your program, and that's pretty much what is framing uh, the uh, the views of the oil market as well, and. And um, within that broader context, of course, we have the geopolitical tensions, uh, but they do not seem to be creating, causing much of a risk premium, simply because uh, we have the uh, the view of uh, plentiful supplies, plentiful of um, spare capacity within OPEC Plus as well, you know, uh, anywhere uh, above 5 million barrels per day easily. So that sort of cushioning any fear that the market feels. And at this point, really, I think the, this is the other major factor. Uh, the market is not really assigning a major risk of a wider regional conflagration uh, disrupting uh, supplies in any sizable way from the Middle East. It's interesting that you talk about those geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. What about geopolitical tensions within OPEC Plus? Because we saw those tensions really come to the forefront last year. Is that also not leading to confidence that we might see sustained cuts from the group. So indeed, that, that is adding another bearish pressure. So um, hypothetically, uh, Sherry, I could say that uh, had OPEC plus, let's say last November, returned to its convention of um, a, a target for the entire group and then parceled out uh, amongst all the members uh, and everybody joining the cuts instead of it being a sort of piecemeal and the sort of voluntary cuts, which let's face it, the market doesn't hasn't really understood what that strategy or idea ideology is. So had OPEC done that, OPEC plus done that, perhaps we would have seen prices support a little bit higher. At this point, uh, the market is really turned quite skeptical. Does OPEC plus have a game plan beyond Q1? Because they have announced cuts, uh, just voluntary cuts by nine members just for Q1. What, what's going to happen beyond that? The OPEC um, plus is seems to be just in a disconnect with the market. Uh, they're not communicating. Uh, if they do have have a, a different strategy, you know, the market is not quite grasping it. So indeed, that is uh, another um, headwind for oil prices. How big of a role is U.S. shale playing here? I mean, for the longest time, we didn't even address the production coming from the U.S., but how significant is it now? 
A major one, Sherry. So um, last year, of course, um, uh, the U.S. production surprised to the upside uh, with 1.1 million barrels uh, per day growth uh, to a new high, uh, 12.9 million barrels per day. Uh, growth is expected to uh, become much more moderate this year, but yet uh, projected to reach another new high of 13.2 uh, million barrels per day. So uh, that is indeed weighing on market sentiment because, you know, you have a major 1.1 million barrels per day substantial growth in the U.S. And not just the U.S., we've seen Brazil and Guyana uh, reach all-time highs. Uh, Canadian growth is growing. And if you look a little bit eastward, um, Kazakhstan growth uh, is, is growing. Um, Norwegian output is growing. So again, the story is uh, plenty of growth outside OPEC+, Plus, uh, whereas uh, perhaps a bit of uh, skepticism over OPEC Plus's ability to continue cutting more, uh, especially if they want to put a floor under prices. Now, through last year, we had uh, the sort of the received wisdom in the market was that OPEC Plus would try and put an $80 floor under Brent. Uh, the market has certainly discarded that, and it's becoming increasingly clear that through 2024, they'll have to cut much deeper uh, if that's the floor they are aiming for. And at this point, the market is really doubtful that, the, that OPEC Plus is capable or even willing to do that. Vandana, we were talking about the weakness in Chinese demand, but what about perhaps some other economies like the U.S., where we're seeing a stronger than expected economic data here and there, potentially surprising to the upside? How much more demand could that add to the supply demand picture in 2024? Yes, yeah, so I think going forward, Sherry, you'll f see uh, a continuing disconnect, as it were, between uh, sentiment in the broader financial markets, perhaps what you see reflected in the benchmark indices, stock markets in the U.S. and, and even globally, uh, a, a continuing tussle between what investors are uh, are betting on in terms of Fed rate cuts and, and what the Fed is saying and, and all of that. But um, for quite some time now, the oil complex has been decoupled from that, and I expect that to continue. What the oil market is contemplating when it looks at the U.S. is really not just the U.S., but U.S. as well as Eurozone, OECD, Europe for that matter, uh, both these regions are seeing um, either a plateauing, in a best case scenario, plateauing of oil demand, uh, or perhaps even a weakening demand. And if you just were to look at 2019, you know, for a comparison of pre-COVID, uh, just the U.S. and Eurozone together, OECD Europe rather, together, uh, are still 1.6 million barrels per day below what they were consuming in 2019. So I think it, the, it's it's pretty clear the writing is on the wall that both these regions and major consumers, right, um, are well be, uh, well beyond their historical demand peak. And in, on top of that, now you, if you see that, uh, if you say uh, you agree that the economies in these regions are going to continue slowing, then you're probably going to see a downward pressure further on their oil demand. And then you have China, of course, continuing to grow, but nowhere near making up for this decline that we are seeing in the U.S. and OECD Europe combined. Vandana Hari, great to get your insights. Founder of Vanda Insights with her views of where the oil price is going. Of course, we continue to see the downside pressure with WTI at that level, 72.29. Still ahead, we actually have a little bit more when it comes to the broader energy sector. We speak exclusively with Panasonic Energy's Chief Technology Officer, Shoichiro Watanabe, about the company's EV battery upgrades. This is Bloomberg. It's time for Japan Ahead on Daybreak Asia. M2 and M3 money stock for December are due in the next few minutes. M3 stock rose 1.7% year-on-year in the prior month. Machine tool orders for December is also due this afternoon. In November, the numbers fell a revised 13.6% from a year earlier. Plus, we'll be watching shares of Resonac and JSR when market opens. Resonac CEO Hidehito Takahashi says they're considering ways to play an active role in JSR's future.
And Japanese markets, of course, will open at the top of the next hour. Take a look at how futures are trading at the moment. We're seeing downside of a tenth of 1% alongside the broader market because we are seeing U.S. futures also under pressure. The Japanese yen weakening passed at 145 level against the U.S. dollar. Of course, last week we've been watching sources tell Bloomberg that BOJ officials are likely to discuss cutting their forecasts for inflation and economic growth. This week in Japan, we'll be watching the CPI numbers. And, of course, we will be watching uh, government bond futures, given that the auction of 30-year JGBs last week saw weaker than expected demand. We'll be also watching geopolitics or at least domestic politics when it comes to Japan because the Kyoto News Survey has found over 86% of respondents backing tougher political funds control laws in the country. That's after a slush fund scandal engulfed the ruling party. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has vowed to fully cooperate with the investigation. Our East Asia government editor John Herskovitz joins us now from Tokyo. John, so what does full cooperation from the Kishida government look like at this point to address the scandal? Well, it looks like they, they'll be available for questioning for, from prosecutors. Some members of his uh, ruling LDP have already uh, turned, gone to prosecutors to address questions. And for Kishida, what he's really trying to do is um, try to head off this problem, a change public opinion. The public has soured on his government. This has made things even worse. Last week, Kishida set up a panel to look at the uh, inner workings, the financing of the LDP. But the uh, uh, opinions show that the public is skeptical about this, and also the idea of um, having the having the uh, ruling party police itself. It's a difficult sell to uh, the general public that this will actually affect change, the type of change that they're looking for. Of course, we have already seen public support for Kishida himself, not to mention some cabinet members also leaving his government because of it. Tell us a little bit about how the government is really addressing these issues and how that's affected uh, their, uh, their performance, how they can actually do their jobs uh, taking the helm of the government. Well, right now, the focus of the government is on the, uh, the earthquake that hit the uh, the Ishikawa region, getting uh, aid to people there. For the parliament session, we have the uh, the budget that's coming up, but probably see that enacted at the end of March as typical for the schedule. And this is really drawing attention away from what the government wants to see as its priorities. For Kishida, it may speed up the time that he actually departs as leader. He's on until September. There's a leadership election in the LDP. So we may see March as a key period for him when he has the budget. And he's also supposed to take a state visit to Washington ahead of the budget vote. So after these two major issues are settled, we may see a little bit of a shift in the dynamics of the inner workings of the Kishida government. Bloomberg's East Asia government editor John Herskovitz there. A stay in Japan because Panasonic says it's planning to roll out the newest version of its EV battery cells as early as this year. Panasonic Energy CTO Shoichiro Watanabe spoke exclusively with Bloomberg about those upgrades as well as their plans to expand capacity. Panasonic uh, Panasonic has long been a world leader in energy density. I believe that North America is very receptive to batteries with long range and that our technology and safety are highly regarded. We have been focusing on Nevada to see how many cutting edge batteries we can mass produce over there. We have learned a great deal in Nevada and we would like to strategically improve our operations there and further develop the new plant. You've set a goal of increasing output in Nevada by 10% in fiscal year 2025. How will you get there? We have been increasing productivity since 2017 and have exceeded our own expectations. Between now and 2025, we will further increase battery capacity and manufacturing efficiency by 5%, which amounts to a 10% increase in overall production. We are promoting improvements in development and productivity. What's your 2024 outlook on the supply chain for EV batteries. Are you having any trouble sourcing locally for raw materials in North America? 
The major purpose of EVs is to eliminate carbon emissions, so it's ideal to develop resources and sell them locally. In reality, most of the products are exported from Asia and manufactured in North America. But we're working in partnership with various companies to recycle in North America and use materials produced there for the future. This is the focus of our current efforts. With the U.S.-China tensions, what's the impact on sourcing from China? Have you been hurt by the export restrictions on those critical EV materials at all? Lithium-ion batteries were pioneered in Japan and have grown in Asia, so we have a lot of respect for the various supply chain manufacturers in this region. However, since our operations are centered in North America, we understand that local production for local consumption is inevitable. Therefore, it's not a simple binary. There are various important factors, and we want to select suppliers who can realize these factors. You're ramping up production of your newest cells, a 4680-type battery. How does that compare to the older 2170? And why do you think a lot of car makers will want to go to that 4680? What's the merit? Since the size of the battery is five times larger from the car manufacturer's point of view, the number of batteries is reduced to one-fifth, and the number of connecting parts and the number of welding processes can be reduced to one-fifth. I understand that this is a big advantage for them. How's the timeline looking for the production of the 4680? Are you on track? We are preparing for production in Wakayama, Japan. We have already completed the building and are now installing the production facilities. Since we are basically on time with both development and production preparations, we think it's possible to start production in the first half of fiscal 2024. What's the one thing Japan needs most to stay ahead in the world? I believe this is a great time to make a big change in the energy sector from the decarbonization point of view. At least when it comes to batteries, Japan has been very proactive. So I think it's very important for Japan to have confidence and to take on challenges. The CTO of Panasonic Energy speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Kurumi Mori. You can catch Japan Ahead every week, Monday at 8.40 a.m. if you're watching in Tokyo, 7.40 p.m. Sunday here in New York. And subscribers can watch us live on the terminal using the TV Go function, of course. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg is live from the World Economic Forum in Davos this week. We'll be speaking to leaders from BlackRock, Bundesbank and others. The market opens in Tokyo and Seoul are next. This is Bloomberg. This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And, of course, we're kicking off trading uh, share across major markets this Asia Monday. And a lot of geopolitical focus, right, digesting those results when it comes to the election in Taiwan uh, over the weekend. And a lot more focus in terms of what else we're going to see in terms of some of these geopolitical headlines this week. Yeah, I mean, take a look at oil prices because they're now under pressure again, despite the fact that Middle East tensions sent it higher last week. So Bell will be really watching the market opens as we're also trying to digest what happens to the Treasury space where we saw another renewed rally last week. Yeah, that's right. Though to note well, as well, of course, our Treasuries will be shut today for Martin Luther King Day in the U.S. So just the open here that we're seeing for Treasury futures at this point in time. But yeah, it was that direction last week, really holding above 4% across the curve. Uh, what else we're watching in the trading session so far today is still that focus on Japanese equities because you've got the Nikkei here uh, trading up again for another session, just fractionally. But still, it has been a very solid start to the year for Japanese stocks. 
stocks and uh, certainly we're now perhaps looking to close in at an all-time high that was reached before the economic bubble burst in the early 90s. So some of the analysts we're speaking to saying there's a strong possibility we actually extend above that. A lot of investors choosing this market for reasons like easier policy settings, corporate governance reform that's still coming through and there's the geopolitical side that's weighing into this as well. Uh, a lot of investors saying they prefer Japan to other markets like Taiwan, uh, even with that election result it's signaling some market calm, but it is that geopolitical tensions in focus. That's Japan. Uh, let's switch on, take a look at what's happening in Korea at the start of the day here, because adding to all of this uncertainty is just what's happening between North and South Korea. And we had North Korea on Sunday uh, firing its first ballistic missile of 2024. That was confirmed by South Korea in a text message. But uh, essentially, the missile, we understand, fired from an area near Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, toward waters off the East Coast. So we can just monitor some defense stocks, uh, see if they move in turn but here we're fairly steady so far so perhaps as well just a function of what's happening with that US market closure on Monday thinner liquidity perhaps a track and we are just seeing Nasdaq futures for instance fractionally under pressure the Cosby again you can see there are just treading water let's change on because we do also have the open of the ASX 200 we're one hour into the session so far it's some interesting moves coming through in the energy complex because we actually are seeing those energy companies moving higher even though Brent crude, as you said, Sherry, is a little bit weaker so far, that focus more on the demand picture that's coming through. Part of that is concerns around the weakness of China's economy. We had credit data, for instance, out Friday after the market closed, told us that households, corporates, they're still not picking up new loans. And so you can see material stocks as well in the red there, Heidi. Yeah, Bell, so much for investors to contend with and we're only just a couple of weeks into the new year, right? But our next guest says a lot of the prevailing themes of 2023 will still be relevant, including rotating gradually out of high-flying large-cap stocks into smaller caps with higher growth potential. With us now is Max Manduri, who's a founder and CEO of SJMC Capital. So it's a combination of that, which makes sense, right, given all of the sort of complaints over the lack of breadth in, in particular, U.S. markets last year. But you're also saying when it comes to perhaps Asia and some of the thematics to double down on any pullbacks. Correct. So with respect to the large cap, definitely taking profits makes a lot of sense. Also because if the breadth does continue and in, in overall we remain relatively constructive on U.S. growth, that means that all of the laggards, all of the names that haven't rallied as much as the mega caps and the large caps are likely to do quite well. And if you look at the growth potential as well as current valuations, obviously they offer definitely some upside potential over there. Therefore, what we're looking at is a rotation, obviously not getting out of the mega caps all entirely but definitely do look at having that rotation into the portfolio. And with respect to Asia, as you correctly mentioned, we do expect this year is going to be uh, quite volatile, a little bit more range bound, definitely, um, unfortunately, not as positive as last year, even though we are constructive, but we would be surprised if we see another year like last year in the equity markets. But basically what this means is that uh, once we do see a correction materializing, then do look to double down on the names that you like. Uh, with respect to Asia, you were mentioning India remains one of our stop downs one of our top picks, Indonesia as well. And then overall, just look at the themes that you like and upon, again, a pullback, do look to add. Let's talk about two of those favorites. You've already mentioned India. Could you give us an idea of what you see as being good value given how expensive that market is? And also when it comes to Japan, roaring start to 2024, even as you look at technicals that are looking pretty overbought. Uh, with respect to Japan, uh, we remain on the sidelines. Uh, we believe that it will continue moving higher because, of course, uh, the Bank of Japan remains extremely accommodative as of now. And with respect to the technicals, if it breaks up, it could keep going. But this big lingering danger of the Bank of Japan normalizing their monetary um, stimulus is definitely a huge risk. And once that occurs, once that materializes, there are going to be big repercussions both on the equity and on the FX market with respect to yen appreciating 
declining and uh, Japanese assets on the equity side declining. Therefore, we, we remain on the sidelines, even though we are cognizant of the fact that in the short term this could keep going. Uh, with respect to the other themes that we like, uh, in terms of valuations, we actually like things that are um, expected to have very good growth uh, opportunities in the future, which remain secular themes going forward. So do look at cybersecurity. That remains one of the focus areas for us. Clearly, AI, we've been speaking a lot about AI, but it's going to remain for us for quite a bit of time. And look actually at some of the names that have underperformed. For example, renewables and clean energy, they're actually coming in quite cheap. And if we get in an environment where interest rates are going to be gradually declining or basically staying lower, then all of these names which require more capital in order to grow are likely to do quite well, and you enter in at pretty good valuations. When it comes to treasuries, do you think there are segments of the market that are looking too bullish now? What do you think kind of their value on where yields will settle for the 10 year? We think that now as market is pricing in uh, cuts too aggressively. So the market is pricing in nearly six cuts this year. We don't think that is going to be happening. We continue viewing two to maximum three cuts from the Fed. Six is definitely too much, which means that the 10 year should gradually stabilize a little bit higher than here. So we're about 4% give or take. I think it should be stabilizing around four and a quarter. Of course, there's going to be fluctuations over there, but it should gradually inch higher, but not much more than here. Uh, clearly, the hiking rate rates and hiking days are behind us, we're going to be looking at cuts. Therefore, it's unlikely that it's going to be moving materially higher than here. But it should stabilize a little bit higher, which means that, yes, tactically, one could look at shorting rates. But it doesn't really make sense. It makes a lot more sense to look to buying more into the fixed income space once interest rates increase a bit too much. And you're going to be seeing uh, moments and opportunities when that happens, because you will see eventually that one off data, which is going to be moving interest rate market and do take advantage of that in order to keep adding to your fixed income exposure. Look at the value of the curve. The five to seven years is probably the area which we like the most. Max, when it comes to China, the market is, is still so skeptical and so avoidant in the large part, right? What kind of a catalyst would you need potentially to find opportunities there? Well, we've been waiting for a catalyst for quite some time now. Unfortunately, it has not materialized yet. And the problem is that the more that we are waiting for a catalyst, uh, the more powerful the catalyst needs to be in order to convince the market that China has, has turned the page. Um, the only thing that is actually going to be uh, driving a meaningful and uh, um, lasting, basically, move up in the Chinese stocks is a move with respect to the political side, but with respect to the business sense. So the international market it needs to have an understanding that the, the business rules are becoming more business friendly within China, and a little bit of these geopolitical tensions are going to be declining. But more or less is the vision with respect to what is uh, the narrative within China, which is, has to become more pro-business, which has not been the case over the last 12 months. And again, now China will need to do a lot more in order to convince all of those international investors, which are not in China now, which have gotten out of China, and which are very skeptical into going back in, because they have lost a lost a lot of money over the last few years. And therefore, they will need to do quite a lot. But again, that catalyst needs to come and needs to come quickly. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be seeing, again, Chinese assets continuing drifting lower. Do you think investors are co being complacent at this point on geopolitical risks? Well, geopolitical risks are always very binary. Uh, so unfortunately, it's uh, hard to foresee them. Uh, but if something happens and escalates meaningfully, then it's going to be obviously uh, big problems for, for everyone, clearly from a market's point of view, but even from a social point of view, even more importantly. But if we focus on the market side, yes, they are um, a little bit complacent. But to be honest, they've been complacent also last year when a lot of those headlines were out there. And we have seen that it turned out that no major escalations has materialized. Uh, geopolitical risk remain the main risks for markets going forward. There's quite a lot of them, unfortunately, throughout the globe. We have seen quite a few conflicts breaking out, which is extremely sad. Um, therefore, when you're looking at your asset allocation, when you're looking at your investment rationals, global investors need to take these into consideration. You need to have some black swan or worst case scenario hedging in place. But again, uh, as of today, hopefully, we're not going to be seeing a mean meaningful escalation, which is again going to be leading on to you know, strong correction and even worse uh, headlines for the world overall.
Max, always great to have you with us. Max Manduri, founder and CEO of SGMC Capital. Let's get you back to Bell in Hong Kong for a look at some of the early movers, Bell. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah, still uh, just tracking a couple of different sectors in relation to earnings because they kicked off Friday in the US, the, the latest season, fourth quarter numbers coming out and some disappointments really here as well. We had Burberry, for instance, London listed, uh, slashing its profit forecast. So they've wiped nearly 100 million pounds or about 120 million US dollars off the outlook. And as well, the CEO of the company saying it's clear that demand for luxury goods is falling, uh, particularly in in those key markets, the US and also in mainland China. So you've got luxury stocks as well in Asia so far, a little bit under pressure here. As Shiseido, one of the, the standouts to the downside of 2.2%. Let's change on because we also had Delta as well, the US airline walking back its profit target in the latest numbers. So they're now saying that adjusted earnings are likely to come in at 6 to $7 a share this year. Uh, the company has had a long-term profit forecast in place of more than seven $7 a share for 2024. So the, the carrier shares, they slumped off that down more the most in 18 months. Rivals as well in that market space were lower. And you are seeing mostly airline stocks are moving to the downside with the exception of Korean Air there. But certainly higher costs seem to be countering the gains from a rebound in international travel. So it is that focus. Sherry as well, don't want to lose sight of the earnings numbers that are coming out. All right, Bell. And coming up as well, we look ahead to the market opens in Taiwan after voters pick their U.S. leader. Our live report from Taipei is next. We'll also be discussing the outlook for chip companies there with UBS's head of Taiwan research. That interview coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. We are telling the international community that between democracy and authoritarianism, we will stand on the side of democracy. Taiwanese President-elect Lai Qingde speaking to supporters after his victory on Saturday. Let's discuss the significance and implications of the election results this weekend. Joining us now from Taipei is Bloomberg Markets co-anchor Yvonne Mann and our Greater China Senior Executive Editor John Liu. Yvonne, let me start with you. You're in Taipei. What message is Taiwan's ruling party sending to the international community right now? Yeah, you heard from Lai Qingde in his victory speech there saying that, you know, this is an opportunity for Taiwanese voters to choose between democracy and autocracy, and it seems like democracy had won. That, you know, Taiwanese are, are now, you know, seeing themselves as more Taiwanese than Chinese itself, and that possibly is what swayed a lot of voters to vote for DPP in this historic win uh, over the weekend. Uh, we have not seen a party uh, win three terms in a row, so this is certainly something that is quite of a milestone for the DPP. Lai Qingde did also win comfortably here with a wider than expected margin, but but there are caveats to this, right? Because uh, he only received 40 percent of the votes. So had the KMT and TPP gone through with this coalition, you know, we would have seen been talking about a much different result here right now. That percentage of the vote of 40 percent is the lowest that we've seen since 2000 when Chen Sui Bian won. And they also, the DPP, lost their overall majority in the parliament. So this is a divided government that Lai is going to have to govern now, and which means the DPP is going to have to reach across party lines and work with other parties in the legislative yuan to get budgets, legislative through here. So that you know, is certainly going to impact the agenda of the DPP. John, what have we heard from Beijing so far? We've had a few comments from the foreign minister. Uh, the response so far, I would say, has been muted. Uh, as you noted, the foreign minister, Wang Yi, was in Cairo uh, at a press conference on Sunday. He did talk about the fact that uh, no matter what the outcome of the election was, it was indisputable that, according to Beijing, uh, Taiwan is a part of China. And so that has been the ongoing theme. Uh, we've also had uh, news from the foreign ministry in Beijing saying they've sent uh, stern representations uh, to the United States that after uh, the State Department sent congratulations 
relations uh, to Taiwan uh, after following the election on Saturday. Uh, I, I think if Xi Jinping had his way, uh, he's got plenty of problems. Uh, the war in the Middle East, the war in Europe, uh, the economy, he'd rather not see Taiwan blow up if he doesn't have to. And Yvonne, of course, very important to the Taiwanese economy are the chips that they produce. Our very own Stephen Engel actually asked Lai Qingde about the importance of the security of this sector during his first post-election press conference. So let's take a listen first. How do you help mitigate the risk that increasing tension with China essentially could weaken that strategic advantage, that strategic importance that the chip industry provides to Taiwan? As long as there's equality and compatibility between the two sides of the straits, Taiwan is willing to engage with China for exchanges and cooperation. We will vigorously assist the semiconductor industry in material and equipment R&D, IC design to manufacturing, packaging to testing to form a more complete industrial chain. Yvonne, how challenging will it be for Lai to be able to really keep the competitiveness of Taiwan in the semiconductor industry when there are so many geopolitical challenges? You're right. And it's interesting that you, you that thought, that sound bite that he just said about you know, reiterating that he is still seeking some sort of cooperation with China. I think that's a, seen as sort of a compromising sort of comments from Lai Qingde in that victory speech. So potentially that's why you know, people are saying we might not see a huge reaction across these markets as well. But as we've seen, I mean, U.S. export controls to China has impacted Taiwan semiconductors as well as the whole tech supply chain here in Taiwan, with many U.S. firms asking supply here on how they're and where they're procuring their chips, whether it's from China or not. So the analysts that we talk to say, look, if you know this DPP win might mean that at least Taiwan secures its position as an independent location to fabricate chips and for AI servers. And perhaps because the DPP has a better relationship with the U.S., that means that they may have better access to chip making equipment in the West as well. So that's the good side of all things, uh, of the things here. But certainly, you know, this whole global trend of de-risking, decoupling, whatever you call it, that's not going away despite this election outcome. We've seen even TSMC uh, really expanding in Japan, uh, build, possibly building capacity in, in the U.S. and Arizona as well. So uh, this sort of friendshoring thing that Janet Yellen calls it, is something that's still here to stay, but the pace of which we see that might, might slow down under another four years with the DPP. Avon, we've been reporting about uh, this U.S. delegation of former officials, right, set to meet with Taiwan and these politicians, potentially another test of uh, these tensions with Beijing. We're now hearing confirmation that the Taiwan president will meet with that U.S. delegation at 9.30 a.m. Uh, on Monday. What do we know in terms of what's going to be on the agenda, the purpose of these meetings? What we know so far is that this is some sort of a congratulatory tour. Uh, that's what uh, we've heard from those that uh, confirmed this trip. Uh, it's U.S. ex-senior officials uh, that we are hearing that are here uh, on this trip as well. And as you say, they're going to be meeting with the president-elect Lai Qingde, as well as the vice president-elect uh, Xiao Bi Kim, who, as you know, is the former Taiwan envoy to the U.S. So it seems like we've, we've seen these sort of delegations come through with the U.S. I think Japan also has has made that here uh, over the weekend, uh, congratulating the Taiwan here on a smooth democratic process. This is going to be a test, though, right, uh, of what this means for the U.S. and China relationship, given how timely this, this trip is, right, just days after this election outcome. But I think, from as, as John mentioned, I think the U.S. and China right now still want to maintain at least uh, cooler heads right now, just given what we saw in San Francisco, those meetings between a Xi and Biden, that they still want to keep that sort of San Francisco sentiment right now, just days after this election. But we'll see how this, mar this, this meeting goes. And John, I'll take it from tensions on the Taiwan Strait to tensions around the Red Sea, as well as we continue to see the U.S. and U.K. attacks on Houthi rebels in Yemen. We haven't necessarily seen a big uh, action coming from Beijing, despite the fact that, of course, their uh, trade uh, ships are really being affected there, too. 
Uh, I don't think we will see any major action from Beijing. It's not in Beijing's interest to, to get involved in any conflict in the Middle East. Uh, they do depend a great deal on oil imports. They need those shipping lanes to remain open, not only to get uh, imports of commodities and energy into China, but to get goods shipped to Europe. Uh, all the same, uh, when the U.S. and the U.K. and other allies, American allies, are out uh, doing the attacks, there's, there's no reason for Xi Jinping and the Chinese government to get involved in that. They can stand back. They can play the neutral party. And when there is, when it's time to come into peace talks, they'll be ready to be part of that peace talk. I'm Bloomberg Markets Go Anchor of Man in Taipei. Our greater China senior executive editor, John Liu, there in Singapore with us. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. You can find that on the terminal for Bloomberg subscribers at Daybreak Go. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize those settings as well so you just get the news on the industries and assets that matter to you. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, the top corporate stories that we're following. Bloomberg has learned that Apple is shutting its 121 person AI team in San Diego, leaving many employees at risk of dismissal. Sources say the group has until the end of February to decide whether they want to relocate to Austin, where they would merge with the Texas portion of the same team. The AI unit is responsible for improving Apple's smart assistant, Siri. Major U.S. lenders wrote off more of their commercial property loans as remote work and higher interest rates pummel valuations of office space. According to earnings releases, net charge-offs at Bank of America and Wells Fargo rose during the fourth quarter, partly due to office loans. BlackRock has agreed to buy global infrastructure partners for about $12.5 billion. The move vaults the world's biggest money manager into the top ranks of investors that make long-term bets on energy, transportation and digital infrastructure. BlackRock will pay $3 billion of cash in about 12 million shares. The deal is expected to close in the third quarter. Sherry, take a look at how futures are opening up in Europe this morning. This as we have concerns about uh, really uh, more downside when it comes to equity assets and, and, and stocks in particular because of, we do have this picture of potential erosion of profit forecasts across the region. Uh, this is a picture we're watching, of course, shippers in particular, shipping stocks surging globally as we see the impact of the geopolitical tensions, the uh, US-UK strikes continuing to play out on the markets. We're seeing Eurostoxx 50 futures up by just about two tenths of one percent. German DAX futures up modestly by about the same amount there as well. Uh, and watching really how whether this tepid start to the year uh, potentially facing more upside for European stocks with what is projected to be a tough earnings season, a soft economic backdrop and the consumer uh, still a question mark there. This is Daybreak Asia. I'm Annabelle Drullers with a check on markets. We're 30 minutes into the session for Japan and Korea so far. 90 minutes into trading as well for Aussie stocks. But you can see the setup today. It's it's very, very steady going. Uh, one of the factors that's uh, really adding to that is we've got U.S. Treasuries that are shut Monday for a public holiday. We'll also have equity markets not trading later, uh, given Martin Luther King Day. And so that's uh, really playing in perhaps a little bit to the dynamic because you're not really seeing much movement coming so far in the the bond space. Uh, currencies as well, just a little bit under pressure for the most part here. So some slight dollar strength. But equities, uh, very, very muted today so far. New Zealand really the only one that's uh, got any significance, but down six tenths of one percent. The Nikkei here you can see uh, just fractionally higher. A lot of analysts as well to note are still optimistic on the outlook for Japanese stocks over the course of 2024. Uh, let's change on because I do just want to put a little bit more into perspective just the, the, the low volumes 
ones that we're seeing. This is the, the uh, average value at time function. You can see that dotted line in blue. It's the projection over the course of today. This is what we see on a 20-day moving average basis. So right now, trading volume is about 20% lower than where they've been on a 20-day moving average basis, which is significant as well, Heidi, when you think over the last 20 days, that's also been the, the lunar, uh, rather the Christmas, New Year holiday breaks. So traders have already been away. It's further thinness on what has already been a low volume trading anyway. We will be watching Bell Taiwanese stocks and futures, which begin trading soon in terms of uh, any kind of reaction that we've seen from the result from the election over the weekend. Analysts have told Bloomberg that the Democratic Progressive Party's victory in the presidential election should bode well for markets in general. Let's get more from our Asia Stocks reporter, Sammy Cha, joins us now for more. And, you know, with, with these election type events, we also always kind of try to remember they markets just want certainty, right? And, and this does present, I guess, the most kind of a certain outlook out of the options that were, uh, were on the table over the weekend. Well, Heidi, the uh, DPP's win for the presidency and it's a loss of the majority in the parliament was priced in already in the markets. And we've, we've seen that the volatility uh, was up in the Taiwan dollar and the stock market two weeks ahead of the election. But we saw that uh, we, we're not going to be seeing too much of an impact. The, the impact is just not going to be um, that huge, the analysts are telling us, because a lot of that has been priced in already. We know that uh, TIEX, the stock benchmark of, of Taiwan has gained about 27 percent, outperforming most of its Asia peers uh, in 2023. And we're going to see that it, this is a huge market that we're, we'll have to be watching. But again, uh, with the uh, market uh, priced in, we're not going to be seeing a huge impact there. We had analysts talking about the fact that Beijing has remained relatively restrict, uh, has restricted its response when it comes to uh, any confrontation with Taiwan before the elections, but they were saying that perhaps in the next few weeks we could actually see more provocations coming from China. How could that factor into market confidence? That's right. We uh, have seen analysts are saying that um, the response, the direct response from Beijing was a little muted. And uh, uh, whereas uh, we will be seeing the results uh, a little more uh, soon after, just like you said, in a few days or in weeks. Or so there definitely will be some more of the volatility that we'll be seeing, especially given that there is high stakes on the uh, on, on the Taiwan equities. Um, it is it is uh, doing well, um, at, you know, compared to the other stocks. But also, we need to look at how uh, the results panned out for the legislature. So the DPP has lost a majority. And a bit of a surprise thing was that the more China-friendly party, the KMT, also losing the majority. And so the balance of power is, again, it lies with Taiwan's uh, uh, People's Party, which is the TPP. And so we'll be seeing a little bit of uh, that uh, push -offs, uh, pushbacks from the opposition when it comes to electing the um, pushing with some of the policies that he wants to. Uh, tell me, aside from politics, what's the outlook when it comes to earnings for Taiwan stocks? Uh, what we are hearing from the strategists and analysts that is 2023 is really going to be the year of South Korea and Taiwan. We, we hear that a lot. It's as uh, we have already heard and we've already seen that it's stocks benchmark doing well um, and all thanks to the artificial intelligence boom and the recovery in the semis. And we're going to be seeing more of that coming back. And also the exporters are going to be doing better in uh, the year in, in, in 2024. So uh, there are some of the sectors that are very uh, that we are watching carefully and of course if uh, especially after the election we're going to be seeing the defense stocks that have already been outperforming um, here we'll be seeing more of the movements there as uh, uh, the DPP spent more of the time and uh, and budget perhaps on the defense and uh, we'll also be seeing some of the uh, of course moves in in tech sector uh, when it comes to chip making TSMC uh, it has uh, more than 
27% weighting on the TIAS index. And so a lot of the tech, tech companies will be moving around it. And when it comes to access of the chip making, um, we will be seeing more of perhaps um, uh, French warring with uh, DPP winning this election as they might have more access to that uh, through the providers, Western providers like ASML. And we could be looking at some of the other stocks like tourism as well as energy sector where DPP wants to move towards uh, the more renewable energy policy. Our Bloomberg Asia stocks reporter Sang Mi Cha there. Let's actually get a little bit more on the reaction to Taiwan's election results and get back to Taipei and Bloomberg Markets co anchor Yvonne Mann. Yvonne. Yeah, joining me now is Jennifer Welch. She is, of course, from Bloomberg Economics and also the former U.S. National Security Council uh, head of China and Taiwan policy. And she joins me here in Taipei. You know, how big of a win was this for DPP, you think? Well, this is an unprecedented third term for any party in Taiwan since they started opening, holding open elections. And that's a major win for them. At the same time, they didn't secure a majority in the LY. So I think for the next four years, they're going to have some challenges advancing their agenda. But overall, I think what this represents is Taiwan's democracy is maturing. The voters have decided that no party should rule entirely on their own, and they'll have to share and compromise in order to advance their agenda going forward. How can we assess, I mean, the Beijing response so far has been quite low-key, muted right now. What's going to dictate what the Beijing approach is going to look like, not now, but maybe in the next few weeks or months? I certainly expect in the next few weeks and months, between now and the inauguration in May, that Beijing may take some additional steps to sort of shape the incoming administration's approach. In particular, they signal that they might take additional measures towards Taiwanese exports. They might continue military pressure around the island. I would certainly expect them also to go after some of the Taiwan's diplomatic partners. But I think two factors are really going to shape how far along that spectrum they go. I think the first is going to be signals that they're receiving from Taipei, and in particular, they're going to be looking looking towards that inauguration speech and what signals they're getting about the incoming administration's cross-strait policy. And the second are the signals that they're getting from Washington. And in particular, Washington has this unofficial delegation out here in Taipei right now. Right. They've been sending signals that they want to maintain open lines of communication with Beijing during this period. And all of those, I think, are going to be important things going forward for how Beijing sees its trilateral relationship and the management of the administration as it comes into power. Of course, we've seen Lai Jingde. He's been labeled before by China as an instant of war, he's a separatist. Can we expect him to really be the continuity president and follow in the footsteps of what Tsai Ing-wen did? Or, or do you think he's going to have to, or he's going to want to pave his own way? I think Lai Chinta is definitely going to stick to Tsai Ing-wen's footsteps when it comes to the cross-rate policy. I think she has set out a moderate cross-rate policy. He has followed that during the campaign and I expect him to follow it going forward. I also think in terms of staffing, we're likely to see him retain a lot of the key folks from her administration, in particular, his vice president-elect, Bikram Shao, is someone who served as Taiwan's representative to the United States, also very much in line with Tsai's perspective on this more moderate approach to cross-strait relations, and I expect to see that going forward. All that being said, yes, I think Lai might try to put his own stamp on it. I think what Tsai has done over the past eight years is try and carve out what the DPP's approach to Beijing is. The 1992 consensus that the Kuomintang has pursued is not what the DPP believes is the right approach, but what is the right approach then. Mm -hmm. And Tsai has come up with some ideas, but I think Lai is going to continue that process going forward. You mentioned about this divided government and, and that, you know, the DPP is going to have to reach out to other parties. What sort of collaborations are you foreseeing? I mean, is the KMT and the TPP really going to join forces? There's still a lot of bad blood. A lot of bad those blood. Two. <laughs> yes, yes. I think the key point will be the selection of the legislative UN speaker. And that will tell us a lot about what kind of power the DPP is coming into the LY with, who it might be working with. For example, if there's a power sharing arrangement, we might see that sort of formalized and who is selected to be the LY speaker. And then in terms of the pivot point, yeah, I think the, the Taiwan People's Party led by Koenja is really going to be a key pivotal role uh, in probably exercising as much sort of influence and leverage with those eight seats as they possibly can going forward. Yeah, could be a minority force to, to really kind of take our uh, attention to here in the next four years or so. Jennifer Welch, thank you so much for joining us here in Taipei, our chief geoeconomics analyst at Bloomberg Economics. Heidi. 
Yeah, sticking with Taiwan, Lai also pledged to further develop Taiwan's chip industry, which is dominated by TSMC. The Taiwanese president-elect told Bloomberg Stephen Engel how his administration will continue to grow the industry while balancing engagement with China. How do you help mitigate the risk that increasing tension with China essentially could weaken that strategic advantage, that strategic importance that the chip industry provides to Taiwan? As long as there's equality and compatibility between the two sides of the straits, Taiwan is willing to engage with China for exchanges and cooperation. We will vigorously assist the semiconductor industry in material and equipment R&D, IC design to manufacturing, packaging to testing to form a more complete industrial chain. Let's bring in our next guest who says the chip sector is turning the corner after a prolonged slowdown and prefers names such as TSMC, MediaTek and AS Media. With us now is Randy Abrams, head of Taiwan Research at UBS. Great to have you with us again, Randy. Um, it's interesting that you're more optimistic about 2024 in the chip sector because usually this sector closely correlates with a global macroeconomic picture, which still seems a little bit fragile in 2024. So how do you see this rebound happening? Yeah, great. Uh, no, thanks for having me on. It's, it's a good point. I think this cycle, the tech sector already went through a fairly deep recession. Uh, recall last two years, uh, we had quite a bit of uh, breaks on the sector, uh, quite a hangover uh, on all the tech goods uh, coming out of COVID, a uh, huge pile up of inventory that took uh, really through the last 18 months to bring down. And we had quite a bit of inflationary pressure. Uh, so this year, uh, we do see some of those headwinds easing. Uh, the inventory in the supply chain is coming down, inflation starting to moderate, and we're starting to get another year away from that real big boom in uh, COVID-driven dri demand. So for this year, I think what, what we see driving it, uh, cloud AI continues to try to catch up to demand at least through first half. Stabilization on PC, smartphone, general server, and we're starting to see and saw a bit at CES uh, a move toward the AI on edge device, uh, which we expect to be marketed quite aggressively this year. I think more of the contribution as we head into next year. Uh, again, we're, we're balanced. Uh, we expect mild recovery. Uh, fabs are not full. So the end customers don't need to be in a rush to build inventory. And we still have auto industrial, which is later to correct, uh, still going through adjustments. Uh, but bottom line, I think we're still heading into mild year after a pretty tough 18 month downturn, which, which really led the macro this time. So who are you thinking will be the winners here in 2024, given the ongoing still challenges, but also the optimism that you talk about, whether it's the, the supply or the demand side of things? A few areas, uh, advanced technology, and when we get the outlook for advanced foundry, they have room to outgrow the industry, uh, largely with very high share of AI products. Uh, as well, we still continue to see the advanced products move to more advanced technology nodes, which carries a higher price. Uh, the other factor I think uh, can win memory sector, uh, which went through a tough period. We're actually seeing in, in our headline of a note earlier this month was New Year's fireworks. Memory price is starting to see a surge and I expect that to do well. And I think relatively for equipment, uh, we're coming off uh, a period of uh, lower investment for, for some of the, um, you could say global players, but we're still seeing strong, strong momentum, uh, both from China and we're seeing memory capex, which which came down quite a bit the last year and a half, starting to come back, really to address things like high bandwidth memory, which goes into AI servers. Randy, it was really interesting being at CES last week in Vegas because everything had to do with artificial intelligence one way or the other. Now, you mentioned the demand for cloud AI to continue this year, but what about, is that going to be the main narrative in 2024 as well? Because when I was at CES, what I was hearing from consumer electronics companies was that they would want to use AI in everything from television sets to anything that you're using at home, like appliances. 
Yeah, it's a shift. Uh, last year, uh, if we go back to Taiwan's Computex show, late May, early June, everything was about cloud AI. And to think of ChatGPT, that runs off the cloud. So the big investment and the big winner off of that was the AI and the GPUs that go into AI servers. This year, we'll start to see broadening out. And CES started that. We expect the Galaxy launch next week to be about that, is bringing AI to devices, uh, AI to the smartphone, to the PC, and also smarter industrial and smart home products, where if you put some of that generative AI processing on the device, uh, that helps where you have faster latency, and you can also address a lot of the personal things you have on the device, where it's more secure, keeping it there, more private, and it's more real time versus going up to the cloud. Uh, there are synergies. We expect hybrid, some processing on device, but also in the cloud. Uh, but that's a broadening out. And I think the good thing for the tech sector is that a broader set of companies benefit if we see a better replacement cycle in smartphones, PC, where a lot of these home appliances. Um, again, I think this mm. year it's like CES, a lot of marketing. Uh, next year we could see more potential, it really drives earnings for the sector. Randy Abrams, good to have you with us, head of Taiwan Research at UBS. And of course, we'll be following those semiconductor names at the open in Taiwan. But Heidi, it'll be really the reaction, the broader investor reaction when it comes to the DPP winning the presidential elections this weekend. Yeah, that's right. And we were just speaking to uh, Asia Stocks reporter, really talking about uh, this idea that some of that certainty has now already well and truly been priced in when it comes to uh, at least uh, equity risk appetite, right? And potentially, as we get past kind of uh, any kind of near-term market reaction, it's likely to subside pretty quickly. In fact, Bloomberg Intelligence saying that within the next one to two quarters, judging by historical trends, what we're likely to see is really uh, that return to focus when it comes to the fundamentals. We are seeing uh, trading up by just about nine tenths of one percent when it comes to FTSE Taiwan index futures at the moment, seeing a, a pretty good rise after that DPP win. Uh, but of course, uh, other ongoing areas of focus for investors in Taiwan, that tech earnings rebound that's expected of up to 25 percent this year and as well, of course, the outlook when it comes to uh, the Fed and other central banks. We do have much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Over the next hour, the PBOC will announce its decision when it comes to the medium-term lending facility rate. The central bank has signaled that it may deploy monetary policy and liquidity tools to boost economic growth. Let's bring in our China economy editor, Joe Dacis, who joins us now from Hong Kong. So this would be an incremental move. What are the expectations, and, and particularly in terms of expectations of actually making a meaningful impact uh, on confidence, which has kind of been the main issue here when it comes to lending? Yes. Uh, well, I think that at this point, look, it's um, pretty widely priced in that there is likely going to be a cut to that key policy rate, uh, lowering the rates on the, that medium term lending facility, those one year policy loans. I think at this point, you're right that it's probably not going to make some kind of meaningful impact in terms of uh, uh, the confidence issue that we're seeing. But maybe it does help ease some of those debt financing pressures that China is facing. Um, at this point, I mean, the, the PBOC does have to do something. I think that, um, you know, a, a, a policy rate trend is one step in the right direction, especially when you look at some of the data that we've had recently. Um, deflationary pressures are still incredibly prevalent in China. Uh, we saw uh, some pretty weak uh, credits data come out late Friday, especially in the, in the realm of uh, corporate financing was, was particularly weak there. Uh, so there's something that the, the central bank has to do, but uh, this is probably not going to be enough. Maybe we'll also see some additional liquidity injected into the, the financial system. I'm trying to ease some of those pressures a bit, but other than that, I think there's uh, mounting expectations that maybe it's that the central bank has to take more advantage of other more targeted tools to sort of aid growth, uh, sort of ease some of these pressures. Maybe that involves reserve of requirement ratio cuts. Maybe that involves more targeted lending, lending through other sectors. But yes, uh, there, there's more that has to be done here, clearly. 
Jill, we're also expecting plenty of data out of China this week, including the 2023 GDP growth rate. The expectation right now from economists is that we did see a big rebound, especially in the fourth quarter. So I wonder if that will make a difference to what policymakers want to do this year as well. Uh, it probably won't make too much of a difference, to be honest. I mean, look, that 2023 data, yes, it's likely um, going to look pretty positive. I'm sure uh, Beijing probably hit, if not surpassed, their official growth target of around 5% for the year. But you have to remember that that fourth quarter data, uh, when you're looking at it on a year-on-year -year basis, it compares to an incredibly weak 2022. I mean, December 2022, we saw um, some continued COVID restrictions, but more importantly, we saw um, really massive outbreaks of uh, COVID throughout the country that really was a put a damper on activity and so those numbers are sure to look a bit rosier than um, you know maybe it's it kind of seems on the surface I think you have to zero in on what some of the month-on-month -month data looks like uh, the bottom line is that again we're still seeing some issues with confidence still seeing some issues with the housing uh, sector the housing crisis unfolding um, that the deflationary data I think is still a concern um, so all of that does indicate that um, you know that we're not out of the woods here China is going to have to come up with more policies um, on both the fiscal and monetary side to really Really sort of build momentum into 2024. Um, so regardless of what that data looks like, I think that um, you know there's a lot more attention being paid to what the first quarter of this year is going to look like. All right, China Economy Editor Jill DC is there. We do have more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the stocks we'll be watching when markets open in Tokyo. Of course, some of these may move given the ruling DPP's victory in Saturday's presidential election. Analysts saying that the win removes key uncertainties for local markets, noting China's muted response and the prospect of major parties having to cooperate on policy. You have a few semiconductor names that we're watching very closely. Of course, the chip sector is so important for Taiwan, and we have seen the Thai seeing a little bit of volatility in the two weeks ahead of the vote, and we're we're seeing upside in futures at the open in Taiwan. That's it from Daybreak Asia, where markets coverage continues. Stand by for Bloomberg Markets, China Open. This is Bloomberg.